Welcome back, everybody, at uh, this afternoon session. So, before we start, I would like to use the opportunity to uh, congratulate Joseph with his uh, 72nd birthday, wishing many, many more active and happy research here. Um, also, I want to thank you for the, the time in the uh, past many years. I got to spend with you. It uh, was a great inspiration. And, uh, well, among the many high qualities, excellent qualities that were already mentioned, uh, I would like to add the following two. Um, I think that uh, you you are an optimist, and sometimes that is very comforting for others. <laughs> And uh, you have a delightful sense of humor. So, in any case, thank you for, for all the time I believe spent with you. So then now, um, can you use the start microphone? With the, excuse me? The microphone, can you use it? Please? Microphone. Ah, but, yeah, yeah. thank you, but uh, I think we will now okay. turn it to the um, So, the first speaker of this afternoon is uh, Professor Guy Henniar of the Universiteit Paris Sud, and he will speak on higher ramification and the local language correspondence for the Thank you for the introduction. Indeed, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to give this talk, as many of us, and most of us, I guess, I have been strongly influenced by the work and ideas of Professor Bernstein, and I thank the organizers for the opportunity to say how grateful and admiring I am. So my talk is on this topic, which you, heard, which you heard already, and it's about joint work with Colin Bushnell. There is a paper with the same title on archive, and it will soon appear. So the main question is the following. The local Langlands correspondence for GLN, when n equals 1, reduces to class field theory. Let me use abbreviations. Now, in class field theory, there is a result about higher ramification. Which I will explain in a moment. So, does the theory of higher ramification in class field theory generalize to local Langlands conjecture for GLN? And as you may guess, the answer is yes, and I have this talk to explain how. Well, to explain first what, to well, recall first what higher ramification theory is. Classically, let me uh, give a little bit of notation. F is a locally compact field, non-Archimedean, of residue characteristic, say, P. And I will use the usual notation, OF is the ring of integers. It has maximal ideal PF and the residue field KF is then finite of characteristic P. Possibly I will have to use other notation later. And so that's on the GLN side, so to say, and you have something on the Galois side you have a separable algebraic closure f sep of f. My field f can be a positive characteristic p, or it could be a piadic field, which is separable algebraic closure of f with this Galois group. Sorry, f sep over f which contains a useful variant, which is the veil group. 
And I may as well explain right away what the Weil group is. Inside of the separable algebraic closure, you have the maximal unramified extension. And the Galois group of F-sep of F, F unramified is the inertia subgroup of the Galois group. And WF contains the inertia subgroup and it's made out of elements in GF acting in the quotient, so whose image in the quotient as an integral power of Frobenius. So this group, GF over IF is generated topologically by the Frobenius and WF over IF is generated as a group by Frobenius. So it's simply a useful variant which will be quite convenient to me. So what does local class field theory say? Look, what, local class field theory. It gives you a bijection, chi goes to pi of chi, between characters of WF on the one hand and characters of the multiplicative group F cross, which can be seen as GL1 F, where a character for me is just a continuous homomorphism into C cross. By the way, my coefficient field is C, a field of complex numbers for characters or for representations which are about to come right now. So now, where does higher ramification come? It's because both groups, WF and F cross, are equipped with, with filtrations. For F cross, it's mostly obvious. You have a filtration with a unit group where UF is the multiplicative group of OF which contains the higher unit groups for each integer, positive integer i, and this is 1 plus pf to vi. On the other side, you also have a filtration which is a bit more complicated uh, for any real number epsilon which is non-negative. You have a subgroup, closed actually, WF, you have that uh, descending filtration. For example, when epsilon is equal to zero, you find the inertia subgroup. Uh, it's a closed subgroup, it's not open. You can define WF epsilon plus as the closure of the union of the smaller ramification subgroup here and WF zero plus which I write PF is the wild inertia or wild ramification subgroup it's a pro P group and in this picture here it sits here in between where I take the maximal tamely ramified extension of F in f sep, and this group here is the wide inertia subgroup. So what does higher ramification say in class field theory, in sorry, class field theory? It says that if you are given epsilon here and chi a character of WF, 
then chi is trivial on Wf epsilon if and only if pi of chi, which is a character of f cross, is trivial. It's trivial, sorry. On UFI, where I is the roof of epsilon, the smallest integers, which is at least epsilon. So this is a very nice behavior of a natural notion of filtration on both sides, and they are related in this way. So the question is really, can we make sense of this in uh, the context of the local Langlands correspondence? So let me switch. Uh, if and only if, indeed, yes, yes. Oh my God, I'll take this as a given because otherwise I, I will have to go through ramification theory and it will take 10 to, so, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, there is a natural filtration uh, which you can read about uh, in uh, Facebook, I suppose, yes. So now let, let us switch to uh, the local Langlands correspondence. Maybe I should write bigger, right? So what is it? It generalizes class field theory in the sense that there is a family of bijections. So sigma goes to pi of sigma, where on one hand you have, uh, so pi n of sigma, let's say they depend upon a positive integer n, but I will usually write pi of sigma. On one hand you have a smooth, irreducible representation of Wf of degree n, where smooth can actually be replaced, smooth means with open kernel, but it can be replaced with uh, continuous up to isomorphism. So this is sigma on the one hand. And on the other hand, the uh, isomorphism classes are smooth, irreducible, cuspidal representations of GLNF, again, up to isomorphism. So where smooth is saying that every vector has an open stabilizer, and the cuspidal representations are those represent smooth irreducible representations which cannot be obtained by a natural uh, procedure of, or, of a parabolic induction from smaller GLNs. So again, this is sigma goes to pi of sigma. Now we have certainly a filtration on WF and there are natural questions to be asked if you have, say, if you have sigma 1, a smooth irreducible representation of some degree n1, you can ask the dimension. Yes, degree in dimension, yes, as in ordinary representation of groups. The uh, first question, for example, uh, if you have some epsilon positive here, you can ask what does it mean for sigma 1 to be trivial 
on the ramification subgroup in terms of the corresponding representation of GL1F. But you can vary the question, ask a more general question by taking another irreducible representation of WF, possibly of different dimension, and ask when do sigma 1 restricted to WF epsilon and sigma 2 restricted to WF epsilon have a common irreducible component. Again, in terms of pi of sigma 1 and pi of sigma 2. Of course, 1 is the special case of 2 when you take for sigma 2 the trivial representation of degree 1 of WF. But it turns out that the answers are slightly easier, as you may guess, to answer in for question 1 than for question 2. So let's see, it, uh, indeed, you see, they are closed, and from zero on, they are uh, contained in, in the inertia group, so they are compact, yes. And from zero plus on, they are pro-p, actually. So, and indeed, so a remark here is that common irreducible components, <laughs> those restrictions are semi-simple as soon as, as, as epsilon is uh, greater than zero. And also, in this case, when they have a common irreducible component, they are actually proportional. Then, if you multiply dim of sigma 2 by the restriction of sigma 1, then it's actually isomorphic to dim of sigma 1 times, it's I mean, easy Clifford theory. Because the, those groups, I didn't say, but it's an, they are normal subgroups. So, by Clifford theory, it's easy. Equivalent for P, or you just stated about the representation? The representation theory, yes. I mean, well, those are finite dimensional representation of groups, and you can see what happens when you restrict to a, a normal subgroup. That's, that, there is nothing to it, uh, in, which is properly arithmetic. And of course, um, what I've asked here for epsilon, that is the restriction to WF epsilon, can be asked also for the restriction to WF epsilon plus. This is just a variant, but it's interesting because I will uh, state some early results now, which are more or less easy. You see, okay, let's, let me just, because it's still on the black, on the whiteboard, uh, chi restricted to WF, and uh, maybe you, nobody can read that. If you add a plus here, instead of having the, uh, the roof of it, you have the integral part. Trivial on UFI. The floor. So that's very easy in that case. But of course, uh, you see here you have only integral jumps. This is the ARF theorem. Whereas in general, we'll have non integral jumps, rational but non integral jumps. So I have to erase something. Maybe not that one, because the notation have to be kept. Let me start with the easy examples where epsilon is either zero or zero plus. And let me examine in both cases first question one, which is easy, and then question two.
Now, epsilon is equal to zero. That's very easy because this means that for question one, you ask whether the representation sigma one is trivial on inertia. And since the quotient of the vague group by inertia is z, this is simply saying that uh, sigma one restricted to if is trivial if and only if sigma one is an unramified character. So it necessarily has dimension one and trivial of WF. And this is easy to express in terms of pi of sigma one for sigma one as dimension one and pi of sigma one is, so if and only if, an unramified character of F cross. So we are in the case of GL1, so there is hardly anything to say here. Now, when you have two representations, sigma 1 and sigma 2, so that's question 2 here, well, proportional, let's say, sigma 1 and sigma 2 when restricted to the inertia group are proportional only when they are isomorphic, actually. That's very easy to see again because of Clifford theory and the quotient is cyclic here, if and only if sigma 1 restricted to if is isomorphic to sigma 2 restricted to if, if and only if sigma 1 appears as a twist of sigma 2 of sigma 2 by an unramified character. And that's very easy to translate through the local Langlands correspondence because the local Langlands correspondence is compatible with twisting by character if and only if pi of sigma 1 is equivalent to pi of chi composed with a determinant. So that's a character of GLn, say n1. tensored with pi of sigma 2 for an unramified character of WF and, well, and pi of chi is an unramified character of F cross. So that part is very easy. It starts getting complicated when you uh, go to epsilon equal to zero plus. So when is a representation sigma one, say of some dimension n one, trivial on restriction to the wide ramification subgroup? This means that it's really a tamely ramified representation. But in terms, so sigma one restricted to this wide ramification subgroup is <coughs> trivial, if and only if pi of sigma 1 has level 0, level 0 is just a term to say that, so it has, a, it's of dimension sigma 1, so pi of sigma 1 is a representation of GLN1 of F, so GLN1 of F contains GLN1 GL of OF, which contains 1 plus MN1 of pi f, so matrices which are congruent to one modulo the maximal ideal. So let's call it this k and let's call this k1. And pi of sigma 1 has level 0, which means that k1 has non-zero fixed vectors in pi of sigma 1. And it turns out that those representations are rather easy to construct, I think. Roger's not here, but he must have known those representations in the 70s already, even though it was perhaps not proved that they were all given by uh, his constructions. 
So I'll, I'll say more about how they are constructed in a moment, but the, the answer has been known and, and is quite easy. So let me go to the already difficult part, which was completed with Colin Bushnell only a few years ago. It's question two, when epsilon is equal to zero plus. So that's one here. And two, so you have sigma one and sigma two of possibly a different dimension, and you ask uh, pi of sigma one restricted to pf and sigma two restricted to pf have a common component, a reducible component, if and only if, well, pi of sigma one and pi of sigma two, so in pi of sigma one and pi of sigma two, the simple characters are what we call endo-equivalent, of course. This is a definite answer only if you know what simple characters and endo-equivalents are. So I'll try to give you an idea now of what those things are. And it will also help me explain at the end that what you can do for epsilon is equal to zero plus, you can do for any epsilon. So if you have is here a restriction to WF epsilon or epsilon plus, whatever, it can be expressed in saying that pi of sigma one and pi of, in pi of sigma one and pi of sigma two, the truncated simple characters, truncated according to some epsilon, are endoequivalents with some notion of endoequivalence. So now I have the rest of the time. I mean, you know the gist of the theorem anyway. Uh, I will not give anything about the proof, but I have the rest of the time to explain uh, what simple characters are and what is this notion, bizarre notion, of endoequivalence. For that, I have to use, well, some, to recall to you, some of the result of Bushnell and Kutzko on the construction of all supercuspidal representations of GLN. They give, in fact, a list. So let's fix N for the moment and call G the group GLN and Z the center, which is made out of scalar matrices. And Bushnell and Katzko finishing a long line of his investigation, starting with Silberger and Gerardin. What? This is what you want to hear, to, to read. There are, some this, there, are, there are some other spheres there. Maybe, maybe it's good to change. I'm sorry. The desk, there are lights. Lights? You can use maybe another one. I don't think it makes a difference. But it's just the light, but uh, I, I can use another one, certainly, yes. So they, they give you a list of pairs here with an action of G by conjugation. And what is J? J is an open subgroup of G. I'll give examples right away, anyway. Uh, containing z and j mod z being compact. And what is lambda? Lambda is a smooth, irreducible, necessarily finite dimensional representation of j, such that, so there, there's a complete list, and I will say, roughly how this list is constructed, such that if pi is a cuspidal representation of G, then there is 
such a pair J lambda, unique up to J conjugation, such that pi is compactly induced from the group J to the group G of the representation lambda, which in this case, since J is open, is simply saying that algebraically pi is simply obtained by tensoring with C of G the representation lambda And in G, G, G is open, this one is smooth, so this representation, even if it's algebraic induction, is smooth. But what is C of G? This is a, the, the uh, algebra, the, yes. The algebra of G over C. So th there are, I mean, if you want to see them as functions, they are finitely supported modulo J. So th this is why I prefer to use the algebraic one. But uh, again, I knew I, I would have some questions. <laughs> So, uh, yes. But the point is that uh, the group J have very specific shapes and the representation lambda have very specific construction. And the main part of lambda is that lambda is constructed from a character of a slightly smaller subgroup uh, and this character is called simple character because uh, I suppose Bushnell and Kutzko have some sense of humor. <laughs> well, it's, it, after you've read their book, you, you discover that you can work with those things, but it's not clear at the outset. So let me give, oh, how much time do I get? That's still some time. Let me give a really simple example yeah, of, sim yes, thank you. So example. Level zero representations, which I've already talked about, those are the cuspidal representations such that the group K1 has fixed points in the space of a representation. Well, you, then J is equal simply to ZK, where remember Z is the center of G, which is GLN F, and K is GLN OF. What is lambda? Lambda is a smooth irreducible representation of J, which is trivial on K1. Remember, K1 is 1 plus Mn Pf. So K mod K1 is simply GLn over the residue field. And lambda restricted to K comes by inflation from a cuspidal representation of this reductive finite group GLN KF. Cuspidal in the same sense that it cannot be obtained by a process of parabolic induction. And those cuspidal representations have been known since the 60s in Green's uh, thesis. And it's extended in some way to, uh, to Z, but it's, this is a very easy extension. So you only have to give the uh, value on the uniformizing parameter of F cross, so that's very easy. So that's level zero representation. Another example, which I call Carrier representation, and which... Uh, so, oh, okay, yes, let's, let's say, what is the simple character in this... Uh, uh, is the trivial character of K1. So that's a very simple character, and very easy to, to describe. But it makes sense only when you consider a more general case. So let me give you a second example, which is quite a bit more involved, 
but uh, which is rather giving more an impression of what the general case is, which is immensely, uh, com at least combinatorially and arithmetically, more complicated. So here, uh, n is again fixed. And you have an extension, e over f, which is supposed to be totally ramified. of degree n. And the group GLNF, you see, by choosing a basis of E over F as the group of F automorphism of E, which you can choose a basis, right? Now, in, in, in the vector space E, you have a chain of OF lattices lambda, which is simply made out of the powers of the maximal ideal here. And you have uh, the stabilizer of this chain lambda, so the element in this group which send one lattice into another lattice in the same chain which is filtered by the maximal compact subgroup, which sends each lattice here into itself, and which is again filtered by uh, k lambda i, for i at least 1, where p lambda is just made out of those uh, endomorphism of E, which send PEI to PEI plus 1 for each I. Okay. So I know you need a little bit more data. Uh, and maybe I want to switch to this uh, blank board, to this whiteboard here, to say that in general, you've seen one example and only part of another example. In general, J has a maximal compact subgroup, J0. You've seen it already in the example. Uh, J over J0 is always isomorphic to Z, so that's an easy step. J0 has a maximal pro-p-normal. If you keep the market perpendicular, it writes better. Thank you. J1, maximal normal pro P. Does it work this way? Does it work now? And J, J0 mod J1, you've seen that already once here, is some linear group of some dimension over some extension K prime of KF. <laughs> And J1 here contains a subgroup H1. So J1 is pro P, H1 is pro P and open. And on H1, you have this simple character. And I will just give you an example of a simple character in this uh, rather easy example here. But how, does, uh, how is lambda constructed? Theta actually gives rise to an irreducible representation of J1. There is a unique one from the construction. There is a unique one which contains theta. This representation, eta theta, has some extension to J. And once you've extended to J, you can tensor, for example, with any representation of J mod J1 tensored by, uh, let's say, tau, tau a representation of J mod J1, such that on the restriction to J0, well, on restriction to J0, it will be a representation of J0 mod J1. That is, it will be a representation of a finite linear group. And you ask that it be a cuspidal representation of the finite linear group. 
cuspidal <coughs> representation of GLD K prime. But the most sensitive part of the construction is the construction of theta, because the cuspidal representation of finite linear group have been known for quite a long time, as I told you. So just one example here. So you have this situation where you have an extra uh, field here occurring in the um, picture, and you have also an element beta in E cross. And you ask that the valuation of this element beta, which I call R, uh, well, actually I will call it minus R, where R is positive and R is prime to N. So this is a very special situation, but it already uh, gives a nice example of a simple character. Now, what is the group uh, J? J is simply E cross. You see, E is acting in this thing by the section E cross is acting by its action on E, is E cross times uh, K lambda to the R over 2, to the, sorry, R plus 1 over 2. Those numbers are not very important. J0 is UE. You just take the maximal compact subgroup. This part is pro P, and so K lambda R plus 1 over 2. J1 is simply UE1, K lambda R plus 1 over 2. This part is the integral part. And H1 is UE1, K lambda, integral part of R over 2 plus 1. So when R is odd, there is no difference between J1 and H1. And when R is even, it's a very small uh, gap between H1 and J1. And what I want to tell you is how theta is defined on this group here. Well, on k lambda, r over 2 plus 1, it's simply given by an easy formula, psi composed with a matrix trace of beta times x, where I have chosen here once and for all a character of f which for normalization purposes I ask to be non-trivial on the ring of integers but to be trivial on the maximal idea. Well, not zero is one. Trivial on the maximal idea, just for normalization purpose. So on k lambda and on u1e, it's anything compatible. Of course, I mean, if you want to define a character of this group, you'd better extend the character which is already given on k lambda to this inter, uh, index in a compatible manner. But uh, this rem rem notice that actually this character here, because beta is in E cross, is normalized by the field E cross. So there is no problem in extending the uh, character which is already given here to the, that group here. And this is one example of simple character. This is this, apart from the trivial ones, this is the simplest example of simple character. In general, what do you have? Well, you have a lattice chain in your vector space F to the N. You have the normalizer, the stabilizer of a lattice chain, which has a natural filtration. You have an element, beta, which generates a field, and this field is inside the stabilizer. And you have a construction similar to this, using the element beta, but not only the element beta, you have some kind of approximation procedure, where you have first the beta 1 and the beta 2, and you pile up this construction. Of course, I don't want to go into the details here. So at least I've 
I hope I've given you a simple idea with, of what these simple characters are. Well, I think this theorem which I stated that the simple characters reflect the restriction of the corresponding vague group representation to the wide ramification sum group is some kind of strong indication that simple characters are in the, have indeed some intrinsic uh, signification in the whole game, even though they are not so easy to uh, construct and even worse to understand. Now, it turns out that simple characters can be transferred, I'll explain, and truncated. As you've seen in the example, well, let's not talk about the trivial character, they, they can easily be transferred to another trivial character somewhere, but in the construction of simple characters you have inside of some uh, Fn, you have a lattice chain, you have a lambda, and you have an element beta in uh, generating a field which normalizes the lattice chain. Well, actually, that's E cross, which normalizes the lattice chain here. And you have a simple character theta obtained using some construction. Now, if you take another situation, F to the N, another vector space, another n, with a lattice chain, say lambda prime, but such that you also have an action of E cross inside of K lambda prime, then the character theta has a transfer to a subgroup of the n f. Well, for the simple trivial character, that's obvious. Here you have the trivial character on this k1, that is the k lambda 1, and you take the trivial character of k lambda prime 1. But for example, in the case of a carrier representation, Well, the transferred character will be given on a group which is J prime, or rather on H1 prime, which was, will be uh, H1 intersect the um, centralizer of E cross in GLNF. You see, I started here in the example of carrier representation with an extension E, which was of the exact dimension N than the group. Here, if I switch to a bigger N, I will have E, which will be slightly smaller, but the centralizer is just a, a linear group, but over E here, uh, H1 prime, let's say, uh, well, let's see. K, K lambda prime 1. So you have a natural filtration of the stabilizer. You intersect here, and here you have K lambda prime, some air prime over 2. <coughs> so you have an additive part here, and a multiplicative part here. And on the additive part, it's just given by 1 plus 6 goes to psi composed with the trace, but here the trace 
on MNF of beta x. And in this, well, you're in a, a group which is really a linear group over E because it's the centralizer of E cross. So you can compose your theta, which was given on U1 E, with the determinant going from this linear group over E to E cross. And theta was a character of, of U1 E. So this is the process which is, uh, well, more or less easy to see in the case of carrier representation and which is more complicated necessarily in the general case. That's one thing. Now, you, we have a definition which is due to Bushnell and myself, two simple characters. Possibly one for GLN1 and another for GLN2, possibly two different uh, dimensions, are endoequivalent. That's a very ugly word, but we could not come up with a better one. If there exist transfers in the previous sense to a common GLNF, so a big one, which is possibly a multiple of both N1 and N2, which intertwine in this big group. So, the there is a conjugate of the first one, such that in, on the intersection of the two groups, they have a common component. It's a rather natural but complicated thing, and uh, which is hidden inside this term here, is that it's indeed an equivalence relation, which is very surprising, because in general, intertwining in a group for characters defined on subgroups is not transitive. You see, if, if theta 1 intertwines with theta 2 and theta 2 with theta 3, there is no reason in the world why theta 1 should intertwine with theta 3. This is true for simple characters and their transfers. And this is one of the main parts of the problem, of the construction. Now, I still have five minutes and more, right? Yeah, eight minutes. I'll bore you to the end. Simple characters can be transferred, but they can also be tr truncated. So theta, a simple character, living on some subgroup H1, which remember is inside the one group of the stabilizer of the lattice sequence here. Well, if you take any positive integer i, you can consider the restriction to, I mean, this, those groups have natural filtration. So you look at the filtration and you restrict your simple character. This is a natural enough uh, process, but this is, a so this process is called truncation but there is some mild normalization. It's called truncation at the level I uh, divided by E of lambda, where E of lambda is the period of lambda. Those lattice chains are periodic in the sense that PF, if, if it's made out of lattices Li indexed by Z, PF of Li is equal to Li plus the period. So when you apply the uniformizing parameter, you get a smaller lattice, obviously, but it's translated, the index is translated by a fixed amount, which is called the period, and you have some small normalization. Yeah. And again, well, once they are truncated, you can apply the same procedure. I mean, the, the transfers 
If you transfer and truncate or truncate and transfer, it's about the same, and you have a notion of endoequivalence of truncated characters. And then you can play with that and give an answer to the uh, second question in general for any epsilon. So let me finish in stating the general result. So that's six. And I want to state the general result because there is a slight twist which surprised us. Well, you see, in local class theory, a character of WF is trivial on WF to VI, where I is an integer, if and only if the corresponding character of F cross is trivial on UFI. So I goes to I. We expected, apart from this slight normalization, we expected to have the exact same result. That is, uh, two representations, sigma 1 and sigma 2, are the same on WF epsilon, if and only if the truncated simple characters, at least their endoequivalence class, are the same at level epsilon. This is not true, at least not true in general. So the result is this. It depends on the base point. So let's start with an irreducible representation of WF. Then there is a kind of function which, when you look at it, looks as many properties of Herbrand function. And actually, in many cases, they are related directly to Herbrand function in the classical ramification theory, which I had no time to recall. <laughs> so I suppose. Uh, you have to know it. Then there is a function which depends on sigma and it goes from non-negative real numbers to non-negative real numbers, which is increasing continuous. Well, actually, uh, piecewise fine, such that the following is true. If I fix epsilon, the level of approximation, that is, I'm looking at the restriction of sigma to wf epsilon, and there is a variant for epsilon plus, and tau is another irreducible representation of WF. Then, sigma restricted to WF epsilon and tau restricted to WF epsilon have a common irreducible component. If and only if, The simple characters attached to sigma and tau truncated, but not at level epsilon, but at the level given by this function. Did I say? Psi sigma, sorry, it's not sigma, psi. Truncated at this level, which is possibly different, have the same endo equivalence class. And so I, I'll finish in a minute. Uh, first, it's very rare that this function psi of sigma is identity. Psi of sigma is identity only if sigma is what we call essentially tame, that is, sigma when you restrict to this wide ramification subgroup is a sum of characters. So it, there are very easy uh, 
situations. Otherwise, psi, uh, psi sigma is not identity. Second, it's possible to compute psi of sigma, but the easiest way to, to compute psi of sigma is to start from pi of sigma. From pi of sigma, you have, we have a definite procedure to compute psi of sigma, but of course it's not so easy to apply because you have to go to, through this process of saying when to truncated simple characters are endo-equivalents, and this is rather difficult to control. But uh, for some, for the carrier representation, for example, we have definite results, and I will talk about that uh, next week. And second, just a brief uh, mention of how the proof is done. How could you prove such a thing, really? So what is preserved under the local Langlands correspondence? What is preserved under the local Langlands correspondence are the Artin exponents appearing on the, in the local functional equation, and more precisely, the Artin exponents for pairs of representation appearing in the rankin zerberg L function. And from the preservation of those pair of uh, Artin exponents for pairs, we get the result. And that's all. I thank you for your attention. Uh, let's, let me see. I've the, the the I think so. I think so, yes. yes. Um, and the second question is, is a little different, I'm afraid. So JKU has done something similar for taming lemma plane. Absolutely. Does this work at all for Tori in general? Okay, well, I mean, you have versions. There's no, there's no handling of wild ramification as far as I know for Tori. I'm just questioning. Okay, the see, so the analog of uh, JKU would be for any group the analog of what I call the essentially tame representations, because I any mean, situation is tame, so the, uh, I, sub I mean, okay, my expectation is that simple characters correspond to the restriction of the conjectural Langlands parameter to the wide ramification subgroup. No, no, but I'm asking about what happens for Tori, where you know the Langlands classification, but there's no result, no complete result. Okay, so for GLN, there is no relationship uh, with a, this field E, which is there with, uh, with uh, anything appearing on the Galois side. But when you are in this same situation, and it, it's also probably the same in JKU situation, you have um, a close relationship between the fields with the tori, the tame tori which appear in the construction of GLN or the group, and the extensions which appear in the Galois parameter. But this is a very peculiar situation to the tame case. Yes. I haven't looked. I haven't looked, but uh, I presume there is no nothing. Um, oh, I haven't thought about that because I mean, it was already hard enough. <laughs> You have a, you have this filtration on the on the, the Galois group or the whale group? Yes. And okay, there is this depth filtration on representations. Yes. So maybe the first naive guess guess would be that they should correspond. So Indeed. Is there some elaboration of this naive guess or just completely wrong? Naive guess? No, no. Your your question is exactly related to, to the first version of the question. When is sigma one? restricted to WF epsilon trivial. I mean, there is a notion of slope for sigma, which corresponds exactly to the notion of depth for pi of sigma. So sigma is uh, trivial on WF epsilon, if and only if pi of sigma is uh, as uh, uh, depth less than epsilon, uh, at most epsilon. Uh, that, that the first question of a simple answer. In a sense, if you know the notion of depth, yes. Okay. Yeah. Think of it a second. Okay. Okay, so let us take. Thank you.